a story called Excelsior. He'd put me in the cage, a diver's cage he had. He forced me into the cage, the cage in the lake, in the pond, with the trout. The cage had been chewed by sharks, attracted to the electromagnetized metal when it had been in seawater. I was the bullying, the chumming, the bait in the buoyant water. He was then a shark. He could do anything with my body. The water was not my element. Yes, it put me in that diver's cage he had. And it put me in the pond. There, in that metal cage. What had happened to that kind man I had known? Yes, he was like the shark outside the cage. And I was there, but I liked how he could change. I liked him being rough. Seeing me almost drowning excited him. The water swallowed my shrieks as I thrashed around. And the water kept swallowing my shrieks as I tried to free myself. All around me, the fish were not panicking. The mirror carps, ghost carps, rods and tenches, they thrashed around too. But from pleasure, they were watching. They were the voyeurs, the mer voyeurs. The pond water moved around me and it was there, there it was, water thrashing like a, a gentle brook which soon moved ever more swiftly scouring and togging me. And this was safer than the coarse river, it moved with force. It was stocked with rainbow trout and brown trout of all sizes. He would tell me their names with his lips against mine. My kiss, Uncle Heinkus, my kiss, rainbow trout. I did not know the beautiful river attracted tourists and trout fishermen, but he banned them all. He banned them all from the river, not me. He had me in that river, and I, I used to enjoy his hands around my throat, on my throat, as he loved me in that way in the river. His body green from the moonlit vegetation, resembling a water spirit. A Vodianoi, if those green things were attractive. If anyone outside was watching, we were almost invisible, blending with the water like sea ghosts. He was on my back. I was his back a Houston Brook horse. He wanted to stay on, stay on me, getting off by ne never getting off me. I could not drown him. Like the brook horse, the brackhouse, and I did not want to drown him. I was drowning. I fought the water currents. All the bitch water spirits had dragged extra gallons of water with them to confound me. I kicked at the currents, trying to scream, naiads drink up, let water pour into their mouths and lungs and drown them all. Oh, crinae, I drink fountains. Oh, limnades drink lakes. Oh, pagae, I drink springs. Oh, potamades drink rivers. 
Oh, LA, Mama, drink the marshes. Leave me to drink my man's kisses. Yes, I was not a strong swimmer. I could not hold my breath underwater too long like he could with his greater lung capacity. I felt he was holding me down there a little longer each time he went to the river. He was always kind to me when it was time for home. The puddles we left were like water beings cast off. We were just us again. There was no more of that rough play. His hands round my throat. All that was gone. He was gentle again. Yes, he was not like that man in the lake, with me in the cage. He was not the shark. I married him. I let him keep his fish. We had our first baby, a little boy. He adored the child and loved him dearly. And he no longer took me to the cage or the pond or the river. Get a hobby, he said. And I found the sewing basket, an etui case, filled with ginghair scissors, thimbles and the like. And I found my sewing encyclopedia, items I had collected before I had met him. When I was still with other men, but never serious about them and to keep myself busy. I learnt these skills, new hobbies, made clothes. They were so much better than the ones in the boutiques or the designer shop. But I never got round to really learning this hobby. I'd been too busy looking for someone who was looking for me. I was not busy now. My man was too busy to be loved by me. At least I had the sewing. Perhaps I could get my son to love me with, with all the new toys I was making for him. Yeah, perhaps I could make the child love me, even though his father, the man I loved, no longer wanted me around. Well, I was making good toys and the baby had new toys, teddy bears, the baby was become an arctophile and that's a word for someone who loves teddy bears. And he was particularly fond of one, this bear. And the baby embraced the toy more than me. I would hold the baby but he wasn't really loving me. He loved the toy. I thought he would stop loving the toy. I thought he would turn his attention to me. But the months that passed kept his affection with the toys. I wanted to change that. I wanted him to learn to love me. And I used my elementary sewing skills to sew without a machine. This bear, 25 centimeters tall, with premium mohair fur, an alpaca from the Andes. And it moved because it was fully cut a pin five way jointed. It could turn its head in almost any direction because it was on a neck with a double disc neck fastening. I gave the bear the best of everything. I gave it ultra suede paw pads, pulled toes, each embroidered paw airbrushed lightly to look real. I gave it a pearl cotton nose and a face that had expression and showed its playful nature. I added glass beads for weight, almost finished, a fine teddy bear, a teddy bear most superior, excelsior, yes, the aspen fibre, wood like shavings, excelsior, the, the fancy stuffing, the best stuffing, that's what I was going to use to stuff the bear. Nights and nights passed. And my man, he would not hold me, and my son would not let me hold him. And my man cradled the baby. The baby was not sleeping. I, each midnight, after midnight, in secret, I followed the two. And they would go to the lake, my man and the baby. 
baby in his strong arms. They would go to the lake and in hiding, I would watch them. I would watch them secretly. Envious of the love the two had. Envious, unable to reach them. Unable to make my man love me. Unable to get my baby to love me. There they were, seal watching. Watch me, I whispered from my hiding place behind the sandy rocks. I can't really swim. I felt close to the sea. I asked myself why, why was I with that man? He had kept me. I lay on my stomach, getting into my rubber coat like a selkie, a sea lion woman finding a skin again, returning to the sea. Thought, leave my husband, pine and die. I wish I could leave him, but I wondered if he would pine for me, think of me, have his heart break for me, and from that heartache die. Would he? Would he? He was singing to the child. The sea breeze was a lullaby. I lifted my face to feel it, feel that breeze. It carried the song that had touched his lips, that came from his lips. I ran home. I took the baby's teddy bear and I unstitched it, then hid it, then tried to sleep. I waited for their return. When they were fast asleep, I took the teddy bear to the lake, to where the trout hatchery was, to where... All the fish were. Yes, I took the teddy bear there. And by morning, yes, by morning, all of my man's favourite fish were dead. Yes, hundreds of his fish dead. The favourite fish gone. And the baby's favourite teddy bear, well, that had caused it. I'd use it to block the oxygen pipe. It was usually, the pipes were usually blocked by clumsy frogs and dead muskrats. The baby, so loved by my man, was gone. The bear that night had, in addition to the Excelsior stuffing, it had the small bones of a baby. Yes, I had stuffed the bear with the baby's bones. It was easy, so easy, to make flesh disappear. Bones did not decompose. Perhaps, baby, you'll return one night, so follow the fish, I said, as I pulled the teddy bear out from the pipe and let it drift with the current. Let the teddy bear with the baby's bones Stuffed with the delicate bones, watched it drift. Oh, baby, perhaps you'll return one night, follow the fish. If you choose not to, just swim to other waterways. The salmon never visit their mothers, learn from them. Yes, the baby salmon never visit their mothers. Never, ever. I pull the cage out of the water. Come back, I whispered. Come back unseen. The end.